Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to another installment of City Lights Live, the virtual extension of the City Lights events calendar, where we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love through readings, discussions, and forums. I would like to take this moment at the outset to acknowledge that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatishaloni peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. We'd like to take this moment to offer our respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. Tonight, we are delighted to have back in the house a writer whose work we've been enthusiastic about for many, many years here at City Lights. I am referring to Micheline Aharonian Markham. She is celebrating the publication of a gorgeous new book, which she has co-authored together with the master illustrator, Fozia Karimi. We are happy to have Ms. Karimi with us as well tonight. The book is called Small Pieces. It is published by our friends over at Dalkey Archive Press, an amazing indie press that has just been doing just very high quality work for a very, very long time. This is a collaboration between novelist and illustrator. It's pairing Ms. Markham's short stories with Ms. Karimi's watercolors. The work is a conversation between two artists in text and image, both side by side, and, and just such a gorgeous edition it is. Micheline Aharonian Markham is the author of seven novels, including a trilogy of books about the Armenian genocide and its aftermath in the 20th century. Her novels include The New American, The Brick House, and A Brief History of Yes. She has received numerous fellowships and awards for her work. These include the Lannan Foundation and the Whiting Foundation, amongst other. Uh, she is a professor of creative writing at the University of Virginia. Fozia Karimi has a background in visual arts and biology. She's a graduate from Mills College here in the Bay Area. Her work explores the correspondence on the page between the written and visual arts. She's a recipient of a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, and also the author of Above Us, The Milky Way, published by Deep Vellum, and she makes her home in Denton, Texas. Join us now in offering a warm welcome to Micheline Aharoni and Markham and Fozia Karimi. Welcome to City Lights. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's so great to be here at City Lights. As some of you know, it's so nice to see some, some names on these little boxes, um, I think is the great, the great bookstore um, in the United States and certainly in San Francisco. Um, but all right, so let's just jump in, I guess. And um, I'm beaming out from a casino in Las Vegas in Posey, <laughs> Texas. And that's my my beautiful background. Um, and let's just see where we go. Do you, you want to start? I mean, this is going to be interesting. We've done this once before, this kind of dialogue, which is fun because the book itself is a dialogue of sorts. And then tonight we get to have a dialogue together, which uh, is so great. Um, okay. Well, I, th I think it's interesting because... We've had this dialogue um, at uh, the culmination of which has been this book for so many years. I think by now it's, you know, we started the project about 11 years ago uh, while I was still, we were both still living in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, in the beginning, I, I think you had a handful of pieces. I did two or three illustrations for this. And then there's this really long hiatus during which time you wrote, I think, several books. <laughs> and I worked on, um, one book across 10 years and then we came back while you know you were living in Virginia teaching there and um and me and Denton Texas um and something I think over that time had happened that thing that happens when you let something still that isn't quite ready to to be born yet um so that when we came back together you you had started writing them again you said are you ready to illustrate these um it seemed to happen very quickly, at least for me, like you had your pieces done. And um, and I think I spent maybe eight months illustrate, illustrating them as they came to me, but it just, it was a very fruitful time. And it seemed like all of it had coalesced and come together really wonderfully. Yeah, I remember that period when that happened. And I was thinking about, as I, thinking about tonight and having this dialogue, the origins of this book, which I, over a decade ago when we started and how I had been writing, and still I'm writing um, novels and love the long form so much, but it was really strange that it was the long 
the long form that made me interested in the very short and um, in the small, but not necessarily. I mean, I think I think of these pieces in this book as prose miniatures. I remember I said that two years ago. I said I think they're miniatures, and I didn't really even know what I meant. And I mean, the miniature obviously, and I know we're going to talk more about that tonight, and you'll share some examples. Engages in terms of scale, obviously, and and mimesis and simplicity. But there's something else about the miniature that is in relationship to time and space, and I think is seeking something when I think of like Williams Blake's work, which I've always loved, and it's so small, mm -hmm. thinking about also what is eternal. Um, and I and so these in some ways are harder to write for me than a book, a novel, um, because I write them fast and they take years to make sure the words are in the right place and that it's distilled enough and, and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, we can talk more through that. I know we're gonna, I wanted to see, I'm wondering if we can talk about the miniature a little bit, if you can, and we'll and show some images and then I'll read some pieces. And then mm -hmm. I also want to talk a little about, I think this book so much is also about our friendship mm -hmm. and not just our friendship as friends, <laughs> friends of life, but um, as artists and the mm -hmm. ways that we've been able to, through the years, we've always looked at art since I've known you, gone to museums with you and your partner, who's a painter, and you've shown me how to look in ways that I didn't know until I met you and your partner, and and how this book so in so many ways is come has come out of that friendship of two of two artists. Mm -hmm. um, I always feel like there's nothing I can say to you that you will judge, um, even if it's really stupid. <laughs> um, and so that honesty and uh, and um, what's the word? Uh, Love. I think trust and yeah, trust. trust is a big part of it. Um, yeah, it's hard uh, as an artist finding other individuals, at least for me, living individuals. I don't, um, I look at art from across the ages, including a lot of contemporary uh, visual art, but uh, I, I read older works and uh, communicate, I feel like, with with my dead friends in that way. I mean, the, 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 my, the books behind me, the books in the space are, are my companions. And uh, with you, the privilege of having a living artist, a living writer in my life with whom I can have that same bond and companionship um, and this conversation that, you know, spans time and space, uh, regardless of where we move to, occasionally when we come together, traveling um, is just such a precious and a wonderful thing. And I feel like that and this, these years of circling around art, around books coming together to discuss those things, to share and our love for um, for visual art and, and for especially, I think, for the book as, uh, as an object, as for me, and I think for you too, the ultimate form, <laughs> um, artistic form has uh, sustained our friendship and also sustained this project over the years. So it's, it's just, it's wonderful to finally have it. Um, yeah, it, when you told me years ago, as you were writing these, that you consider them miniatures, um, I had to really think about that because my my relationship to the miniatures through visual art, um, and 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 I think literature generally has its um, counterpart in poetry. Uh, but you are you and I are both prose writers. So in prose specifically, I, I don't think I've really come across it or, or at least have not been conscious of the fact that that's what I'm reading. And so when you said these were miniatures, I had to really kind of process that and take it in. But as I spent time with your pieces and over the years have looked at miniatures in art, um, I've come to understand that that's exactly what these are. Because the miniature to me is um, work that is distilled that's elemental and has these attributes which I'll share when I share some images um but your written prose work in this book is exactly that it's elemental it's distilled it's um crystal like in places and yeah like, really jewel like and just luminous as a result of that um so I, I'd love to share some images now just to look at some miniatures and and um in art, mainly Eastern, although there's the Western counterpart, which is the illuminated manuscript. Just give me one second as I yeah, go full look story. for my play button on here. Let's 
excuse me, the Zoom is not allowing me to get to the keynote. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so this is uh, an old Indian miniature painting. And um, these paintings do this wonderful thing where they collapse space. Um, it, the depth of field has been completely flattened into one single plane um, so that everything is drawn with the same clarity, the same um, color. Uh, there, there isn't, we don't have that, um, the changes in, in color, the shifts that you get when you're paint, doing a painting and you have something in the distance versus something in the foreground or midground. Um, this is all done with equal attention and equal uh, fervor, I would say. Um, and so space is flattened, but so is story um, because you have this ritual that's happening. You have the gestures of the people involved in the ritual. You have the animals in the background who may be tell the backstory of what this ritual is about. The forest as well, like all of it comes together on a single plane. Um, and it's this moment and yet it just, it tells you so much. And I find with Michelin's pieces in this book that, that they do something very similar um, where they, yeah, they just, time kind of collapses, space collapses, and you have this really wonderful um, combination of things that just happen simultaneously in the same moment. I love and, too how it these, um, the, it's not a one point perspective. They always are multi-point perspective. So you can, your eye can go in lots of different places mm -hmm. and just, and see. So it's it's this way of, this. it's the way the eye actually, I think, more close to our vision, you yeah. see fullness and your eye gets to move around, unlike say, um, you know, photographic image, which always is one perspective. Yeah. Uh, in this next image, uh, which is a Persian one, it happens with both space and time and um, really takes you across an entire culture <laughs> in a single image. So in the foreground, for example, you have uh, the court the musicians of the court. Um, and as your eye travels around this, you see the farmer, you see the shepherd, you see um, perhaps somebody in the cave in the background meditating. You have um, the animals. It's just all the different aspects of a single culture on a single plane flattened again. But then you also have time completely flattened because as you, again, as your eye travels across this, you're going from season to season to season so that everything is happening simultaneously, which is what the Cubist and Western art were doing later in a very different way. Um, but again, back to Michelin's pieces, they, they seem to do that. You have um, you know somebody who's talking about being in Europe or being in Berkeley or um, on the East Coast, all in a single short piece. And um, and as the reader, you take it all in at the same exact moment and have the experience of all those spaces emotionally at the same exact moment. Um, and I think with all good work, there has to be room, like a puncture in the piece um, for the sacred as well, which in this piece is on the upper right. Uh, everything else is at the same scale, regardless of what distance it's at. But you have this giant head peeking out from behind those mountains in the background. And um, and yeah, you, it, it's the uncanny, which I think enters into good works of uh, art. Another thing that, uh, give me one second, I'm also in charge of admitting people. So I'm sorry, I have to You're fine. Stop, stop the share in order to be able to do that. Okay. Be right back. Of that head in the upper corner of that piece. Yeah, of this last image. It's it's wonderful. So as I was looking at these over time and reading Michelin's pieces um, as the illustrator of them, uh thinking about them, I also realized that she does this, Michelin does this other thing in this book where She'll take a single moment, like a very, very brief moment and a couple of lines of text and that is all there is. Uh, and within that space, there's all this expansion. There's this single moment becomes a very expansive one, just as in this painting, um, you know, taking in the scent of a flower in that moment, you have to 
um, be open to that expansion. Uh, so when reading the pieces, I find that I have to give them time as I was illustrating them. I had to be with one piece at a time. And if it wasn't the right moment for that, to illustrate that piece, I'd come back to it another time. But um, be in a relationship with it and give it complete space so that it was just that language and the symbolism that came up for me in that moment um, and go with the image that, that arose with the piece that she'd, she'd written. Uh, yeah, I, one of my favorite pieces in this book, Micheline, is your first one, the one that opens the book. Uh, and it's one of those pieces, just that moment that is completely expansive. Um, so at this point, I'm going to read a few of these. And then, Fozi, I know we're going to go back. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how you did the, the paintings. I don't think of, they're not illustrations, they're paintings. And for me, I mean, the one of the amazing things about working on this book with you uh, has been the way that you conceived of the book itself, the codex, that beautiful old technology that you designed from cover to cover. It's the only time, I mean, you you were able to do that in your novel, Above Us, the Milky Way, but that I have been able to be part of a book's design, which, you know, we, when you love the book so much, um, to be able to say yay or nay or this color or all that stuff. And so um, I know we're supposed to be selling books, but this is for me, <laughs> but I mean it, this is a book that uh, ought to be read, I think, in book form. So I'm going to read, I think, seven of these, unless it goes too long, in which case I will cut one at 625. I'd like to have time at the end for Q&A. Um, some are very short, like this one that I'm going to read. It's the first one. There are 26. I can never remember pieces in here. I've written a number of them. I don't know how many at this point, maybe 100. <laughs> and then we chose uh, the numbers for this book. Posey was like, no, not that one. Um, <laughs> So oh, uh, anyway, this one is called On Writing, and it is very short. The titles themselves are really as much a part of the piece as, as, as anything. So On Writing, she says, I lean my ear in and listen. Okay, so like I said, that was really short. That's the whole thing. And yeah, next one, Fosio. This is longer. I think it actually might be the longest piece in the book. Um, what's interesting when Fosio was putting it together, where to put this image, you don't see it on the page at first. So it comes about halfway into, into, the, into the prose piece. And it is called Two Things Put Together in the Imagination of the Artist Afterwards. The painting. Execution sans jugement sous les rois morts de Grenade by the lesser known 19th century artist Henri Regnault hangs at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. I saw a reproduction of it by chance as I flipped through the pages of a book of the museum's collection in my home in Northern California one Sunday afternoon. The colors in the reproduction were shades of yellow, orange, red, dark green and a luminous white for a marble staircase. The tall executioner stood on the top stair in a long caftan in the style of the Moors and wiped blood from a sword in his hand with the sleeve of his robe. A man's body lay supine at his feet and in the bottom left quadrant of the canvas, two steps lower, was the man's severed head. The muscular arms of the beheaded were the most dynamic feature in the reproduction. One lay flat with the palm facing upward in a pose of defeat, while the other was positioned at a right angle, hand pressing against the stone, as if the dead man had been lifting his torso or his head at the moment it was removed. Blood pooled on the white stairs between the body and head, and several critics had noted the artist's greatest accomplishment was his fine rendering of it. Months prior to looking at the glossy coffee table book, I read an article in a rock and roll magazine about the drug war in Mexico. Included in the feature was a color photograph of two men suspended from a bridge in Cuernavaca. 
The men were shirtless, their trousers had been pulled to their knees, each had blood covering his torso and thighs, and while one of the bodies faced the camera's lens, the second was turned from it. The bridge and the bodies were colored the most striking shades of orange and red in the reproduction in the American magazine, the blood appearing almost black, the second man's ass was covered by it. When I came upon the reproduction of Regnault's painting two weeks ago, I remembered how one of the hanged man's arms in the photograph was positioned at a similar awkward angle, and I recalled my initial bewilderment when I first glanced at it before I came to understand what I was seeing. The documentary photograph of the two beheaded Mexicans hanged from a bridge in Cuernavaca, it seems to me now, ought to exist next to the 19th century painting, as they did in my imagination that Sunday afternoon, at least for the duration of the reading of these words, and for no other reason than to, in some small manner, commemorate the dead. You know, the other thing I didn't say is when I was thinking about these pieces, I wasn't really interested as probably will become obvious if it isn't already in the conventions, our normal conventions of stories, which are plot and uh, developed characters per se. But again, this idea of moments or fragments or distillation or time and space collapse, whatever it was that was capturing my kind of attention. And I think about art as, you know, a way of being attentive um, to the world and to the realities of the world that sometimes uh, we, we don't, we need to be able to see in a, in a way that art allows. This is a shorter one and a little lighter in tone. I wrote this when I first got to Charlottesville, Virginia, when I was like, what the fuck am I doing here? But anyway, um, and it's called The Problem with Dogs. This is for Cosimo, my little dog. I walked through Oakwood Cemetery this morning between the limestone and marble headstones, past the massive branchless tree trunk on the rise with my small dog off his lead. When I noticed he was no longer trotting at my side, I called out his name and spied him several feet behind me with his back leg mid-air, readying to mark the plastic flowers of a sepulcher. My shouted protestations that he come here now to no avail. And I thought to myself, how little respect dogs have for the dead. That's supposed to be funny, I guess. <laughs> Those are the only you. Oh, Alan, I can hear you laughing. Okay. Um, this is probably my fit. I don't know. I also wrote this in Charlottesville, actually. I was wandering around. This is called, um, not very long, a little bit longer than the last one, but they often are quite short or small. Uh, this piece is called Misericordia is a Virtue, provided it is not mere passive sentiment or sentimentality. The lobsters lie piled one atop the other in the aquarium at the supermarket where for $12.99 a pound, you can buy a fresh one for your dinner. Thick red and yellow rubber bands clamp the crustaceans front claws together, restricting thereby their mobility. Those of the uppermost animal layer lurch hurly burly across an agitated landscape while the lowest tiers of the living or dying lie mostly immobile in their own handicapped state. I stopped for a moment to admire what I might eat at some future hour, and I noticed the colorful rubber bands, the massive hobbled front claws, the strata of light brown bodies, the jerky movement of two walkers as they pitched toward the glass and away each animal an unholy merchandise available at the supermarket from seven in the morning until 11 at night, three miles from where I live, 187 miles from the coast. Uh oh, are we doing okay for time, Fozia, do you think? Um, eight, oh, 6.33 your time. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, I think we're good. Um, this is called Fado, November 2009, and um, 
Well, maybe we'll talk about it later, this image, because this has a really funny or kind of an interesting history in terms of when you um, when you did yeah. this. Painting. This is, um, yeah, so Fado November 2009, and um, this is dedicated to Fosia. A road which was no road traversed a dry riverbed, and I found bones when I traveled to the depot of bones, 89 years after the deportation marches from Harpet in old Turkey to the Derzor desert in Syria, because I wanted to go home, but the road, the place did not exist, she said. Or perhaps her life is a tether of old stories, old feelings handed down one person to the next, much like the light blue cotton headscarf crocheted along its edges, her great grandmother made she was told, for her grandmother, who gifted it to her mother, and she passed it to her in a gradual move from east to west, Harpet, Beirut, Los Angeles, a portable faded blue cotton estate. Now, she sits inside a large concert hall in Northern California, listening to Comque Vos, and beneath her sternum, in that small hollow, or is it a tiny convex mirror reflecting the dry riverbed, the not road, the chalky 89 year old radius she discovered in the earth on a trip she took to the Derzor desert five years ago to find the evidence she told her friend over a drink after the concert of their existence. The old feeling returns. I know it too, her friend said, the sea, the sunshine of Los Angeles after she emigrated from Kabul as a young girl. Because when the Fadishta performed the old song of separateness from the even older poem, it seemed for a moment that everything, voice, guitar, acoustic guitar, heart, blood, sternum and bowels, the Portuguese songs of fate, the abandoned villages and bones of the old Armenian clans in old Turkey, the newer, unrecovered, ghostly dead in Afghanistan, was brought into correspondence. Yes, her friend agreed, we can none of us, ever return. So some of these are about animals and some of these, uh, like the last one are more, I suppose, personal. Um, and just, it's interesting to read them now because I, I remember them in the, in the space and time when I, when I wrote each one, um, not always the same. And some that took me so many years to sort of try to figure out uh, this one, and you'll talk about this, I think, in a minute, this painting, right, Fosia, is called uh, Taken Into Consideration. There is an epigraph by William Blake, who I love, and I know Fosia loves too, and it is, the busy bee has no time for sorrow. The population of the Western honeybee has declined an estimated 50% in the United States since the 1970s, and for a long time, no one understood what exactly caused tens of billions of bees to just disappear. In 2015, an independent group of 29 scientists concluded that the family of petrochemicals known as neonicotinoids, a new class of neuroactive insecticides, the first one patented by the Bayer Corporation in 1985, coated onto seeds so as to be absorbed into a plant systemically as it grows, cause injury to bees, and even a small sublethal exposure to the poison inhibits normal cognitive function so that an affected individual can't, for example, navigate its way back home. At the time of the study, neonicotinoids had become the most widely used class of insecticides in the world. The two leading commercial manufacturers, Bayer Corporation and Syngenta Group, questioned the task force of 29 independent scientists' conclusions and conducted their own in-house research to evaluate the effect of their products, Admire, Advocate, Platinum, and Cruiser on bee colonies. The representative from Bayer Corp said they believed the prior study was not objective, while the technical lead of Syngenta's ecological risk assessment commented that while it was undeniable that if a bee is exposed to a pesticide, there's stress, there are, quote, multiple stressors, and they all must be taken into consideration, end quote. 
the last one. It's funny, I'm remembering that one. That one was so hard because it was like, how do I put all these technical corporate terms into a piece? And you know, trying to figure out how to do that. That took a while. Is it this is the last one? Good. The last one. Uh, this one is very short. Um, I love this painting. Um, and I'll remember, and maybe we will talk about it next, when you sent it to me, the just the shock of seeing this piece, uh, the painting in response to, to the miniature prose. Um, this one is called, Upon Being Asked, What is Love? At the back of my lover's blue eye, there is a blue door. And when we met six years ago, he said, welcome. And he opened it, she said. I love that piece, Michelin. Yeah, I love the painting. Um, so Fozzie, you're gonna keep, you have a few pieces I, I think to show us now, cause I'm hoping for at least um, maybe five, 10 minutes or so, depending, or five, that you can talk about the paintings themselves. Mm -hmm. um, we did another book together. Well, I wrote this, that weird novel, The Brick House, whatever it was about a house where people go to dream. And, and, in, and I sent you the text and you did illuminations very much like an illuminated book. Um, but this was different. This was working together. This was this is dialogue. So, uh, you know, there's the prose pieces and then there's your art pieces. And as I've said to you from the beginning, or especially when this book began to come together and, um, you know, blessings to City Light and also Deep Vellum for being willing to do it. Uh, there's a third thing that happens, which is the the, the visual art and, and the reading and that and the third thing between them. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I just wonder, and so many of these so surprised me when I saw them um, in the in the best way. And I just, how did you come to do these? And can you talk about, you know, you're a visual artist. Um, you used to be a, a, a biological illustrator. You're a novelist. Rosie's novel, Above Us, The Milky Way is extraordinary. Um, can, can you talk about your background in visual art and, and book art and maybe even illumination yeah. versus illustration? Yeah, of course. Um... I'll start by saying that earlier we were talking about um, the miniature as an art form and uh, as a visual art form, and then your work as a uh, you know literary a prose miniature. And um, I just want to clarify that I didn't go into it uh, thinking that I was doing miniature and painting. These are not that at all. Um, they're very symbolic, and that's the way I think I tend to work. Um, and I also, I mean, for me, it, it's all about, um, attention to, a, to a singular thing at, at a moment and, um, and a devotion to that. And my practice comes from doing biological illustration for many years. So, uh, for, for a long time, I, I knew I wanted to be an artist, um, I don't think I knew what kind, but I, I assumed art, you, you paint if you're an artist. So I had this very, you know, great desire and a really deep love for it. But uh, in my family, I couldn't take that direction until I couldn't say no to it. I was going to go into medicine. And um, and then I finally just, you know, kind of came out to my parents as an artist, which wasn't easy and, and took a couple of decades for them to finally accept. And, um, and so I, I didn't do art for a very long time. I went to college to do art, but I, I studied uh, pottery and photography, and that's what I did after college as well. Uh, I didn't draw, I didn't, I didn't paint, I didn't really know how to, I didn't have the practice. And then um, the art world just uh, turned me off, honestly, on um, the art world in LA where I worked at just, uh, it didn't line up with, with my own uh, feelings about, about art. So I went back and, and I did something else that I, I love, which is science. Um, I studied biology with the hope of going into the botanical sciences. But um, along that, you know, on, on that journey, I, I came across biological illustration. I've always loved the old biological illustrators, the botanical illustrators of past centuries. Um, and so I, I somehow I, I became one. <laughs> and um, and so my, my experience comes from doing these really tight, uh, highly accurate, small watercolor paintings of biological subjects. Uh, I'll share a few of those with you. 
Uh, these are um, Darwin's finches from the Galapagos Islands, showing the different beak forms um, and what they eat, depending on which of those islands that you know each each of these finches was on. Uh, the, this is actually not watercolor, it's um, color pencil. So the, the, the funny thing is, is that I went this really roundabout way of coming back to painting and, and drawing, and I learned how to illustrate uh, through this job as in, I became an illustrator and simultaneously had to, had to learn how to do it. So I'll, I'll just show you a few of these, and um, I'm going to share a few of these insect grubs with you uh, because I, I write about them in the book in the introduction to the book here's a caterpillar but this one in particular this this beetle grub uh, you look at the thing in real life and when you find it in the soil and it's it's not the most um, beautiful thing it's it's actually pretty disturbing and disgusting when you come across it but in painting it I, I found that pretty much with any subject including a grub um, a maggot you when you paint it when you pay that sort of attention to it when it becomes a singular thing that your eyes and, and your mind focus on in a very direct way it quickly uh, becomes a thing that your heart focuses on and zeroes in on as well so that you fall in love with these things and um and that happened again and again and again with any subject whether, whether it was marine or insect or plant um the mammals I had a hard, harder time with only because because of fur. Fur is, fur is a whole other thing. We won't go into that. But um, yeah, you just you just fall in love with these forms, and um, and I was really sad to leave that work. I had physical issues as a result of doing it for so many years, and that's why I turned to writing, which I think in the end was a good thing. But when I came back and was illustrating my book, and then Micheline's book, and finally this this collaborative book. I found that I kind of can't escape escape doing it in this very particular way, which is to focus on a singular thing in a written piece, to draw that out. Um, usually it's the thing that um, the piece distills itself into a singular thing in my mind and rises up as an image. And, and that's what I end up painting. And even with this book, there was a process in the beginning, like the image of uh, the city um, Harpert, uh, Micheline, that you were talking about, that's uh, more realistic, I guess. It comes from just trying to illustrate something. So the early images are more straightforward and more about illustration. But as time went on, I really allowed the symbol to rise up and, um, and take the place. Um, I'm going to go back to that image. Micheline, you want to talk about the, the background for this? So Micheline told me, or she gave me the piece, I read it, and um, and I went online not knowing what to look up, but I thought, I I don't think I knew the, the name of the place through the piece. I just knew that it was it was a city in Armenia and, um, and looked at so many different images and zeroed in on a very particular image. And I painted that one and sent it to her. And she said, wait, this is the city. And, um, and there's so many of these little coincidences throughout this process where, she's working on something and somehow it makes its way through the writing but without her having to say anything specific um and I think back the other way as well where I think the the pieces that I painted would go back and speak to Micheline in a way that I wasn't expecting they would say things that I, I didn't know were there um so there's sort of this undercurrent this other conversation that's always going on aside from from the more literal um surface one yeah well I wonder if we should do questions now if anyone has any or um I'm just going to share this one last image Micheline which is uh when I was trying to put the book together um and we were trying to figure out the order of the pieces I um, had them all laid out on my table. So this is this is an image of the book's design and layout and process. Wow, that's great. I don't think I've seen that before. Hmm. It was so much fun to do this with you. Oh, it was it was wonderful, Michelle. So lonely and you know. <laughs>
Um, yeah, that was so much fun. And you can probably see, even though those of you looking now, I mean, they, yeah, they start more sort of uh, recognizable and sort of in forms, and then they, they do become some of them anyway, later in the, later in the book, a little more distilled. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go ahead and stop the share now. And Peter, are you going to take over for if we want? Yeah, to I'm just waiting for people to post stuff. So everyone, um, now is your chance. If you are curious about the creative process, if this has somehow evoked something, post it in the chat. Raise your hand, um, and we can talk. I think it's going to take folks just a second. Yeah, no well, I'd love to hear a little bit more about like, you know, just the way you both went back and forth and, and what that process was like, you know, I mean, you know, and how it just kind of, you know, like, it seems to me like alchemy, you know, like there was something going on there between the two of you that really began to kind of coalesce. And when you listen, you know, it really, the, the images and the words come together in just amazing ways. I think it that happens when you're working on your own as a writer. There's that alchemical thing happens if if you open the door to it. Um, but it was so wonderful with Michelin because of that trust that we we have in each other. Um, seeing it happen between us, you know what I mean. I, writing is such a solitary effort that um, that I hadn't experienced that before. Where were because of this trust and this love for this other human being and and just with great admiration for her, her work um yeah the store opens and and these really wonderful things happen and stack up janet asks what inspired you to write in the miniature form um you know it's funny i remember I think partly because I've only worked in long form. I've only written novels. I do not write short story. I wish I could, but I just can't seem to do it. I keep going on and on and on and on and on. It's almost as if I can only write the novel or this other thing. And I didn't know what it was and I didn't have many models for it, but I knew I wanted to work not just the fragmentary, but like some sometimes just, you know, like uh, the scent of something, you know, something that isn't, doesn't have to be a novel, but can be the whole thing, but just, I'm, I mean, I love essence and distillation, and my earliest uh, inspirations were Kawabata, if you know his book, Peter, you probably do, Palm of the Hand stories, so he invents this form or makes it, it, it's not the whole hand, it's the palm of the hand, these stories, and I love them, and I can't explain why, but I've always loved them, I find them strange, you read them, and you're like, Okay, I might read it again, you know, um, because they don't center around again this plot or character. A lot of the Chekhovian, maybe you'd say, which I love too, but that wasn't something I, I wanted to do. So it's partly I'm experimenting as a writer and trying to train myself also in something else, which I didn't know what it was. Um, and Fozzie, I sent her some earlier and she's like, these are great. And they weren't great, they were awful. But that was great about Fozzie. She's like, no, no, I really, I love these. Um, the other person was uh, Thomas Bernhard. Do you know his stories, Voice Imitator, where it's just these snippets from the news? I loved those. Later on, Ponge, his nature things. Um, eventually, Kafka's aphorisms, but I've only read those last year, and that was that was actually the book I think was already going forward. But I think it's probably just wanting to work. I, you know, I, if I were a visual artist, I'm not. Um, I would. I, it's wanting to work in another way. Um, partly inspired that. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Let's see. Nancy asks, you mention the influence of Thomas Bernhardt. Could you expand on that? Oh, he has this. I love Bernhardt's novels, but he has a wonderful book called The Voice Imitator. I think in English, it's The Voice Imitator and like a hundred pieces. And, it go, and, um, and I think mostly, apparently he was a, a he read the, the news every day, the newspaper at that time. And you he these beautiful little like very kind of newspaper pulled stories. And I, I don't, it's hard to explain what, like it seemed with Kawabata, but he just taught me something. He taught me in some ways more than Kawabata because Kawabata is just, <laughs> he's so extraordinary. He's so, he's such a master, you know, you just sort of, 
you learn, but you're not, I don't know what I'm learning, but with Bernhard, I could see technique and he taught me some technique that I tried to use. Like, how do you distill in a way? And like the piece I read about the honeybees, you know, I, at that time I was obsessing about it. Probably a lot of us were, they're dying, you know? And I was like, how do you take that piece of information and make it into a, a, a work of art? You know, something that also will endure beyond its moment. And, and Bernhard, and he's funny too, if you know Bernhard's work. Um, so yeah, I think I'm so grateful to him and his work and that something around technique I learned from him there. Uh, I don't seem to have any other questions, but I just wanted to, Fosia, if you have any parting thoughts as we approach the top of the hour or comments. Um, I think one thing that Micheline touched on earlier, which is that the, the pieces in this book, the, the titles are just as important as... Um, as the, the body of the text, like the text in the title is, is extremely important. I gave it prominence uh, on the page for that reason. Um, and we also did a series of, of postcards, but again, just use only the titles because I think they're really phenomenal. I was saying earlier that each piece sort of needs space and time around it. You read them slowly and you know just let it sit for a bit. And I, I almost feel like you have to do that with a title, let it sit and then read the piece. And let that sit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know how well these lend themselves to out loudness, but hopefully it was something. Oh, uh, I would say uh, very powerful. Good. Yes. I mean, so, any way that I get to be at City Lights, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope to get you actually inside the store someday. Once again, we're kind of starting to ramp up our inside the store events little by little. Um, well, I really want to take a moment to thank you both for gracing our virtual halls and congratulations on this just absolutely gorgeous, very evocative and, uh, you know, very, very touching artifact. Uh, I want to you. remind everybody, we have posted links in the chat with which you may pick up copies of small pieces as well as other books. And uh, better yet, you know, if you're in the hood, come on down, browse our stacks. Um, we are located in San Francisco's historic North Beach district. We are open seven days a week once again, and now from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. We are getting back to pre-pandemic hours. And also to point out that this year, it is the 70th anniversary of City Lights. If you can believe that, it just seems like we just had our 60th. Um, and we're going to be featuring a special calendar of events. It's going to be running through to the end of the year. We've got an event coming up this coming Sunday that's just like this marathon poetry reading it begins around one there's going to be music and so on so keep an eye on our events calendar for pending announcements for more events and also want to mention that today's event has been made possible by support from the city lights foundation which continues the legacy of our founder the late lawrence ferlinghetti through public events like this one our publishing program and educational outreach um bozia micheline wow such a pleasure Likewise. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone who came. Yeah, thank you all.